Hello, everyone. My guest today is Lou Wang. He studied computer science at UCLA and Stanford, then founded RoninApp.com in 2008 before selling that to GoDaddy in 2013. He then founded his current company, Reamaze, in 2012, which is multi-channel help desk software. Lou, are you ready to take us to the top? Yeah, let's do it. All right. This is a hot space. Tell us more about the company and how you make money. Sure. Yeah. So as you said, we're a multi-channel help desk. And what we do is we help businesses talk to their customers. Um, you know, as you mentioned, we, I, I did my first SaaS startup a few years ago. And one of the things that I noticed from there was that having conversations with customers in a meaningful way leads to sales, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, part of our story is helping businesses make money by talking to their customers. And that, that comes in a variety of ways. So support, obviously, is, is one of the central channels um, that comes through email, chat mobile, but also sort of outbound messaging and proactive messaging. And this is a SaaS platform? This is SaaS, yeah. Okay. How much does the average customer pay per month, would you say? So we have two, we have two plans that we sort of publicly list pricing for. And one is on a $20 per seat. And the other one is $40 per seat. Okay. We have about a 50-50 roughly distribution of that. We also have an enterprise plan where we do custom contracts with folks for sort of like a yearly contract, yearly commitments with things like training. And they pay a little more for that. Yeah, it sounds like there's like maybe an upfront setup fee, which is great for you because it makes them stickier once they go through it. Yeah, for sure. And, and, and it helps larger companies, our larger base, um, sort of get onboarded uh, with, with training and things like that. We put up time up front, they put time up front, and that certainly helps with things like retention. And what's the difference between someone paying 20 versus 40? What additional things do they get at 40? Yeah, so at, at 40, we have things like multi-brand. Uh, we have things like a live dashboard. You can see who's on your site, proactively engage with them. Uh, we find that typically uh, companies who are running multiple identities, maybe different product lines, different storefronts. And this is a Procter & Gamble or something like that. Exactly. They're going to go with the $40 plan. And then... The $20 plan, you'll see smaller businesses, um, mm -hmm. e-commerce shops that are sort of a mom and pop shop would sort of nicely sit there. And how, you know, when I think customer service like this kind of stuff, especially doing some research on your UI, I think front app. And when I think like yep. website engagement, I think like intercom, right? So I mean, are you kind of a combination of both? And if so, how do you carve out a niche specifically for yourself? Yeah, that's a good question. And like you said, it's a hot space. We have competitors. I think what we do is we focus specifically on the, the support aspect of of conversations more than those folks do. I mean, as you mentioned, uh, proactive messaging is a part of their stories as well. Um, what you'll find is we have a lot of the traditional help desk features that you also find in, in things like a Zendesk. Got but it. We do it in a more modern way. Interesting. Okay, and let's kind of put this on a timeline. When did you launch the company? Uh, we actually launched in 2012. Um, it was interesting because uh, my first company, I was running that at the same time too, and I was approached by GoDaddy to acquire that company. And so what we ended up doing is sort of putting Reamaze on um, hiatus for a little bit, came back to the company um, in 2016, actually. So that's sort of the timeline. We've had two years now where we've been sort of going full speed ahead. Why did GoDaddy want to acquire your first company? Um, it, well, GoDaddy, GoDaddy is an interesting company because they're also, in some ways, one of the largest SaaS companies in the world. So, you know, people typically think of them as a domains registration and website hosting company. They also have a portfolio of SaaS apps and, and the, the SaaS app that I was working on at the time fit really well with what they were doing there. Did you build significant wealth for yourself through that exit or no, it was more like an aqua hire? Uh, <laughs> I did, I did fairly well mm -hmm. out of that. Um, but you know, being an entrepreneur, I've, I've always wanted to be running my own company. So as soon as we felt like the situation there made sense and, and that SaaS application was in good hands. Um, you know, it was time to, to give it another shot again. Was that a function of something being in your control or more about an earnout kind of thing? And you left right when that was done. Uh, no, I actually, we had we, the deal that we struck with GoDaddy was actually very favorable um, to me as an entrepreneur. And because so, no, no earnout, there was no forcing you to stay. There was, there was a little bit of an earnout, but I actually stayed longer than, than. Oh, great. What, what the terms were. Yeah. Okay. And you come back to Rhea May. So that what you said was in 2016. That's right. Okay. Got it. But you, you started working on it back early in 2012. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. We and, founded the company. Yep. And who's we, uh, my co-founder, David and, uh, 
and a co-founder on the technical side, Hang. Okay, so three. Now, did you guys just say, okay, we're going to just, we're best friends, we'll do it even 33, 33, 33, or no? Was it a little different than that? It's, it was a little different than that. Why? Help, you know, it's a hard conversation for founders to have. Give us some insight there. How'd the conversation go? Um, so part of it was uh, sort of the effort up front that I had put into it. So the cap table looks a little different based on that. Um, so different people sort of came on as co-founders at different times. Now, when you think co-founder, you know, everyone's there day one. That's not always quite the case. Um, effort does get put into it beforehand, sort of putting together the app. A lot of software um, can be built before you sort of have an entity around it. Mm -hmm. Yep. That makes good sense. So weighted obviously towards you because you were there, you know, four years earlier. Yep. Take me through, uh, again, some of the growth now today. So how many, how many customers are you serving today? So uh, we have over a thousand customers. So last I checked, it was um, right under 12, uh, 1200, sorry. Okay. And that's businesses. Um, and we have a very interesting distribution wherein we have very small customers and we also have very big customers, as I mentioned. Enterprise. Well, normal, normalize that for me for a second. So the logos is important, but you also kind of build your product and everything really around per seat. So across 1200 logos, or like, are we talking about double that in terms of seats or quadruple that, or how many seats are on the platform? Yeah, so, so we sit between three and four seats on average per per logo, as you say. Okay, got it. So you could then say, you know, somewhere between 3,600 and 48, you know, and 5,000 seats, basically. Yep, that's right. Okay, fair enough. And then have you bootstrapped this or raised capital? We raised capital at uh, 500K. Okay, what, why, and when was that? Was that before, was that in 2012, the early days, or, or 2016? Uh, yeah, that was, that was early days. We did that, and that was with friends and family. So it was, a, it was an interesting situation, obviously, with that. But the reason why it was because uh, sort of the upfront development cost of putting t together the software before we knew we had revenue. So this is, uh, given that it is a B2B situation, um, it, it was very apparent upfront that this would be a company that would get recurring revenue in a SaaS model. Um, and so putting together the application up to the point where you could get to a revenue, uh, you know, it, it requires a little bit of investment there. Yeah. So that was 2012. Let me ask you, how did they all feel when you went full time on your other company and left them sitting there on the cap table? Um, it, it's, it was an interesting conversation. And I think uh, given that it was friends and family situation, um, it, that, that helped that conversation. And I, I think they all knew that this was going to happen again. Um, mm -hmm. Even with the conversations with GoDaddy at the time, it was it was publicly known that I had this other entity that was going to happen. Mm -hmm. Got it. So once you sold, you said, okay, I'll now focus my time back here. They're still same cap table, same everything. And they're all excited to see what you build now. Yep. Are you, are, are you raising today or no, you don't need to? Well, we don't need to because we're... Uh, operating fairly well. Now, of course, when it comes to raising money, that's one of those situations where we feel like if the right situation came along with the right valuation, that's always, you know, something that we can talk about. Yep. What's the team size today? The team size is at 15 and that includes, so we have a, a remote culture here. Um, and so given I'm, I'm based in the Bay area. Yep. Cost of living here is a lot higher. Um, what I found is that, you know, building a team remote allows you to bring on more folks, expertise from all over the place, um, without necessarily hampering you in terms of cost. Yep. And what are, you know, since you've doubled down on this in 2016, what are you now growing the thing at year over year? So for example, uh, in 2017, I think we were, we were under 500 K ARR and we're over that. So we've more than doubled in since the last year. Yeah. I mean, and we can get a minimum kind of of where you're at now, right? If you have the minimum 3,600 seats and then you multiply the times the minimum of 20 bucks a seat price, it's like 70 ish grand a month. Are you North of a hundred at this point? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Are you North of 200? Well, that's no, we're not North of 200. So okay. we're, we're right in that range, but it's where we do significantly more than $20 per seat because the average tends to skew towards the, the 40. Yeah. 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 And well, look, look, let's give you the benefit of the doubt there, right? Even at 40 times 3,600 seats, that puts you at like 144 a month. So somewhere between 100 and 200 is great. Somewhere between a, call it a, a you know, 1.5 and $3 million run rate. That's, that's obviously healthy growth over 500 in, in 2017. So congratulations. Where's most of that growth come from? Is it, is it expanding from one person on a team to 10 or getting new logos entirely? Yeah. So we do that through a combination of content marketing, through sales, um, 
And then we're also integrated with the several platforms that bring us <clears throat> sort of the smaller companies, smaller logos um, that tend toward the sort of the $20 uh, seats. Mm. And this, these kinds of price points, I, I assume you probably dealt this at Go, with, with this at GoDaddy as well. Churn is critical, right? What is your churn today and how do you manage it? Yeah, so our churn, last I looked, I think we're at under 2%. I think it was like 1.7% and that's uh, customer churn. Like logo churn per month? Yeah, per month. Right? Yeah. And, and we don't really measure revenue churn. Um, and that's just because there's sort of revenue growth on a per account basis as well. So, you know, there's that whole term of negative churn or negative yep. revenue churn. Are you in net negative churn? Yeah. So we our accounts in terms of revenue um, on a monthly basis. The revenue per account grows faster than, say, the, the revenue churn. Yep. Yep. Which is obviously what gives you that net negative churn number. So then that's not easy by the way. So, so nice work there. Um, and then what do you, what do you pay to acquire these customers typically? Uh, so we go through, uh, Google AdWords, um, Facebook, Quora, you know, you could all, all the various channels that you've probably heard of. Um, we pay on a CPC basis. The average cost per customer, um, ends up being slightly higher right now than sort of what we get back from the LTV wise. And that's just because. Well, what is that number before you dig up the story? Um, I think, I think it's about $200 per, per account. Okay. And why do you, and why do you say that that's, that's lower than the LTV? Cause if you're only turning 1.7 logo churn, that means they stay with you on average for 50 or 60 months at a $40 yeah. price point. It's like no, twenty three. I, 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 I misspoke. It's not really LTV. It's sort of the upfront revenue that we get from them from month one, month two. It takes a while to reacquire that. So yeah. So what's your payback period today about? Um, it's, it, it's about three months, I believe. Yeah. And that's, and that's you know, that's going to depend on the size of the company that we capture. Usually when we go through these advertising channels, it's usually self-serve customers. Mm -hmm. And then once in a while we get a warm lead that we can go send, you know, sales and do sort of white glove sales on that lead. Yep. 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 That makes sense. Um, so what do you, I mean, you've sold a company before you've kind of done that. So there's nothing about your ego that's saying, let me do it again. I've never done it before. I'm curious what it's like. I mean, what's your, what's your mission? What's your mission with the company? What do you want to do with it? Grow it. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where, as you said, like having had an exit before I've, I've ha sort of had the luxury of not having to chase that. And so, uh, you know, I just enjoy doing what I do, um, growing this company and, sort of building it, working with the team, growing a team. That's also something that I didn't really get a chance to do the first time around. So we sold the company very early um, at, we at two, three people basically at yeah. that time. And so seeing sort of a different experience with growing a team, a much larger team is kind of exciting. One of the biggest mistakes I made at my first company, Heyo, is when everyone else was raising huge rounds and I thought it was very frothy, I had a large acquisition offer on the table and I walked away from it and then sold for way less than that four years later, trying to just stick it out, waiting for the new feature or the better onboarding, blah, blah, blah. Many would argue that this space, I mean, right, you just saw 50 go into Drift. You saw 50 some odd go into to, to Matilda and Front App a while ago. You saw, you know, Intercom is raising like crazy. Well, many would argue that it is a frothy, overvalued space right now. And if you're in this space, you should take advantage of it. And sell if you get a five or seven or 10 X multiple on revenues. If you got a seven X multiple on your current revenue, would you sell? Uh, you know, that it's very tough conversation to have. And one of the reasons why is because that depends on the buyer. So one of the things I learned during the first acquisition is the buyer does matter. Um, what situation you get into after the acquisition does matter and sort of that integration period and what they plan to do with your team. And all of those things are considerations that, mm -hmm. It, it, it's hard to just say, given a dollar value, would you do it? Yeah. Are you, are you based off what you've learned? Are you the kind of guy where you'd say, Hey, yeah, take the company, but I want to keep my team and go launch a new company with them and just keep doing that the rest of your life. Uh, you know, yes, but uh, I would say that depends on team members, right? Certain team members are probably going to be better off in, in that new situation mm -hmm. um, where, you know, especially if you're going to a large company and they're, they're doing things like benefits and 401k. Yeah. <laughs> and like some, some employees are going to want to say, Hey, you know what? That's a pretty nice situation. I kind of want to do that. And some are going to say, let's, let's, let's do it again. Right. Yep. Yep. And then the last question that kind of talked about the exit scenario again, right. would you raise capital today if the right offer came along? And if so, what would that right offer kind of look like? Yeah, I think we would. And I think honestly speaking, I, I think we're in a stage where we're going to have to grow a little bit more to get that favorable valuation that we'd want. Um, 
but yeah, we, I mean, that, we're open to that conversation with yep. someone to come along. And, and, what kind of valuation would make you really happy? I mean, what do you think is fair that also makes you happy? Um, it, it's going to be sort of a, maybe 10 X the ARR, you know, that's in other terms, obviously when you're raising capital, other terms do matter as well, but that's yeah. sort of a rough ballpark of what you kind of would expect. So assuming you're like, call it one five AR today or 2 million, you're saying we'd love to see a 15 or 20 million pre-money, something like that. That's right. Yeah. And, and, and how much capital would you like to raise because you know you could deploy to drive growth? Yeah. So one of the uh, things we're, we want to do, obviously, we, all, all software companies want to do is hire good devs, right? And so having have enough money to go and build out a team that can sort of accelerate the product is important. And so mm-hmm. I, I don't have a dollar amount in mind, but I kind of know if, if I saw that amount, I would know based on, you know, could what kind of what kind of devs, what kind of sales and marketing folks am I able, able to bring on board with that? Yeah. Let me just be more specific for you. A lot of VCs listen to the show and they'll reach out to you afterwards and be, Hey, I heard you wanted this much. Boom. Here, like, let's talk more about it. If you're, <laughs> if you're raising out of 15 or 20 and you only want to sell 10% of the company, you're looking to be looking for like, call it 2 million bucks or something like that. Is that kind of, is that kind of money meaningful in terms of you being able to expand the engineering team? I, I think it is. Um, especially given that we hire both remotely and sort of locally here in the Bay area, we can sort of get talent from for, for two or three. I think we can get some pretty good talent. Yeah. Good stuff, Lou. Let's wrap up here with the famous five. Number one, what's your favorite business book? Um, probably Lean Startup by Eric Ries. Number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying right now? Well, yeah, actually, I, I, given the GoDaddy situation, I actually had a good chance to uh, watch the uh, inner goings of, of that company. And it's a very large SaaS company. So Scott Wagner at GoDaddy is someone I, I watch and sort of study from. Number three, what's your favorite online tool for building your business besides your own? Um, I'd probably have to say something like Stripe, given just how easy they make making money. <laughs> Number that's a, that's a, that should be our new slogan. We make, make we make making money easy. All right. Number four, Lou. How many hours of sleep do you get every night? Uh, six six hours probably. Okay. And what's your situation? Married, single, kiddos? Uh, yeah. So that's I think that's a little different than most entrepreneurs you get on your show. I'm actually married with kids, two kids. Why do you say it's different than most? Actually, I can give you the exact data. 79% are married with at least one kid. Really? Okay. So not, not, not the ones I, I, maybe it's just sort of the sample, sample size I, I was watching, but. Oh, yeah, you listen to the show? Yeah. Oh, yeah. good. So I've, I've been married for a long time. <laughs> okay. Married, two kiddos, and how old are you? I'm 35. 35. Okay. And uh, by the way, someone who's listening right now has like 50 that's been married for like 30 years are going to be like, what does he mean he's been married a long time? How long have you been married? Uh, I got married when I was 20. So it's been 15. Okay. 15 years. Well, congratulations. That's great. And uh, last question. What do you wish your 20 year old self knew? Uh, enjoy the process. I think, you know, one of those things is as a young entrepreneur, you're setting a lot of goals for yourself and you have all these ideas of where you want to be. But I think sometimes along the way, you can sort of lose track of it. Just enjoy the process yep. of getting there. Guys, there you have it from Lou. Enjoy the process. He launched this company back in 2012, raised 500 grand on it, then refocused on a different idea that then sold to GoDaddy. After that sale and after he worked there a couple of years, he then shifted back to Remaze in 2016. Really, you can think of him almost like a front app or intercom, but dedicated exclusively to the support function, not just kind of outreach on a website or things of that nature. Today, there are 15 people, remote locations. They've got about 3,600, oh, sorry, they've got about 1,200 logos using them with between 3,000 and 5,000 seats total doing call it 140-ish grand per month today. That's up over 100% year over year. Churn is 1.7% logo churn per month, net negative revenue churn because expansion is uh, driving a lot of growth right now. $200 CAC, so about a three-month payback period on a lifetime value of between call it 50 and 60 months or about two grand. Lou, thank you so much for taking us to the top. Thank you.